Beautiful. All right. Well, welcome again. It's Jason here, your resident training customer service kind of jack of all trades, master of none uh, <laughs> uh, expert. And uh, I'm here just to introduce the, um, the the speaker for today. Um, I do want to just make sure, firstly, you guys can hear me. Um, okay, if you could just thumbs up or yep, gotcha, something in the chat would be great. I'll be monitoring that. Um, just uh, no point me blabbering on and introducing. Uh, Fiona, if you cannot hear me. So please let me know loud and clear. Thank you so much. Uh, and can you all see the screen? Um, is that working for you as well? Get the tech checker. All good. Thank you, Brad. All right. So here's how it's going to work today. Um, we, I'm going to just do a quick intro and I'm going to throw straight to Fiona. It's going to last for about uh, well, we've said an hour. It may be less because Fiona wants to do some Q and A and and also have a bit of open time as well. I want it to breathe with you know you guys and make it relevant to you. So, uh, but it won't be any longer than that. It may be, in fact be closer to the 45 minutes. We will see. First one. So let's just go with what we've got. Um, with regards to uh, the uh, managing the microphone, you're doing a perfect job already. Please just stay on mute unless you've got a question. If you do have a question and it's relevant to the content. By all means, come off mute and say, excuse me, quick question. You said this, please, Fiona would love to uh, relate it to you specifically. Um, if you'd like to write any other comments as you've already started in the chat box uh, on the Zoom session, please do so too. I won't be monitoring Facebook, unfortunately. Um, so if you're watching live, feel free to chat amongst yourselves, uh, but I won't be there um, because too many screens. <laughs> I can't multitask. Um, so before I launch into introducing uh, Fiona, um, I just wanted to let you know a little bit of a backstory. Uh, we met uh, doing a Hills Chamber podcast. Fiona was actually interviewing me, talking about our business. And um, it was uh, it was a really great podcast. And we got talking about other oh, years. Hi, Fiona. Um, we got talking about uh, sort of health and well-being. And I, I just sort of rang her back or me and Molo back at one point and said, hey, would you be interested in a webinar for me or for us? And she went, absolutely. You know, what kind of things? And I said, well, we're all stressed out. <laughs> We're all working all hours, you know, trying to maintain a massive workload, anything that could help. So she came back with a curriculum and, and we started working on the PowerPoint. Now, as I, I, I said, look, I'll help with the PowerPoint a bit, just, you know, make it look nice and trendy. And, um, and I, as I was helping the PowerPoint, I learned a couple of the practices, right? So I didn't think too much of it up until, um, up until this morning when I started to do a virtual hybrid uh, induction for um, a group of uh, people up at the um, Hillside Hotel. And then I, I also had people from Ginger all over the place all coming through virtually on the computer. So I had all this technology, turned on my laptop, had 2% left, and then suddenly it, um, I put the plug in, it didn't work, and the whole thing died. And now I had no laptop, no virtual, no presentation, and I had about 40 minutes until everyone started walking in the room. And so, because I'm running around going, okay, just, you know, stay cool. There's got to be other solutions. Maybe get another laptop, whatever. And uh, it, as it got closer and closer, you know how you do, you start kind of sweating because you've got a kind of a deadline to meet. And uh, then I went, hang on a minute, the breathing exercise. So I just stood out the side of it, the, the room just before I got in there. And I did one of uh, Fiona's breathing exercise, just a couple of reps, just to slow myself down, regather my thoughts, and start getting creative about solving this. And luckily enough, we actually have Michelle on the call now um, who attended that uh, uh, induction and it, it worked, didn't it, Michelle? <laughs> it worked. It did. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for uh, not uh, not noticing all the sweat pouring off me. Um, <laughs> but um, so look, um, that's I just wanted to say, you know, the, the reason we do these things is so you can take something and you can use it to improve your well-being. And I just did that this morning. I wanted to share that. Um, but really, uh, without further ado, I think we'll just move on to um, the main event, uh, and that's obviously uh, our guest. So Fiona Kane, a nutritional medicine practitioner and a mind-body eating coach, and uh, you're from the local area, I believe. I'm in uh, the Hawkesbury. Yeah. Oh, well, even better. <laughs> just up the road. That, right? <laughs> Um, oh, that's fantastic. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, you've got uh, a great presentation today. I'll do my intro. And I'm going to throw you the remote. All right. So not only is she in a, in a beautiful part of the world, she's also an award winning nutritional practitioner uh, and uh, has found her, her own business informed health, which has got a couple of uh, nutritionists there, I believe. 
Yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on anything here. There's You're also two of us. <laughs> Sylvia. Okay, that's what I was trying to make it sound. You know, like more of a conglomerate. Um, all good. Well, look. Um, really, you can introduce yourself and fill in the blanks. Um, I'm going to just move this uh, remote over to you. I'm, uh, you should see something pop up on your screen. And uh, yeah, guys, if you have any questions, come off mute. Ask him. As I said, anything else, chuck it in the chat box. Any links or information that Fiona's got, um, we'll follow up with after the the session. So. Buckle up, enjoy, and I'm going to pass it over to you. Welcome, Fiona. Thanks for having me, and thanks, everyone, for taking the time out. I know it's a really busy time of year, so thank you for being here. Uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about myself so you know uh, why I do what I do. Uh, I'm 51 years old now, um, but when I was in my 20s, I actually didn't think I was going to make it to 30. I had several strokes when I was in my 20s. And it completely changed my life. It completely changed everything. And I had to learn how to get well and how to stay well. But I also had to learn how to manage my anxiety and stress around that. When suddenly something like that happens to you, uh, it really, you lose your confidence in your body and your health and your ability to be okay. And, uh, and it was a long road really back to uh, being okay for me. And, um, and I've got two autoimmune diseases and I've had a lifetime of having to just manage, manage well my health issues so that I can stay well and have a good life. And so I learned at a quite a young age that um, how to manage my physical health, but also how to manage my mental health. And the last couple of years, uh, I think everyone's had a stressful time. And, um, and I spent a lot of um, last year in palliative care with my mother. And I started running stress programs while I was in there. So it was, um, you know, I was going through the most stressful period of my life and running stress programs. So anyway, it's a topic that I is very close to my heart, a topic that I know very well. Now, I have lost the slides here, Jason. That was me because I was so interested in what you were oh, saying. Oh, okay. You're, you're just giving back yes, to me yes. when you, okay, cool. Okay. No problems. I just thought, <laughs> did I press something? <laughs> No, I didn't. So anyway, stress is a really, uh, it's, it's close to my heart. So uh, I want to just share with you some of the strategies that I have learned and also, you know, take your questions and just try and help you manage well as well, because I think it's, it's not so much that we can't stop the fact that stress happens. Stress, stress is stress. Stress is part of life. And stress isn't necessarily a bad thing. We need some stress. We wouldn't get out of bed and go, up to, go to work if we didn't have to pay bills. And, you know, a certain amount of stress is okay. And there are going to be some uh, challenging, stressful times that happen in life. It's just a fact. So it's not about stopping stress or not having stress. It's just about learning how to respond to it and learning how to make yourself more resilient so you cope with it a bit better and so you uh, can roll with the punches a bit more and not to get knocked over every time something stressful happens so so anyway that's just a little bit about me and why I do what I do and I, I studied nutrition and counseling and, and other strategies like that because they were things that I needed and eventually I thought okay I think other people could uh, benefit from what I've learned so I started practicing about 15 years ago so uh, and bear with me I've got a few physical notes so sorry for making a little bit of a noise turning the page but it just helps me stay on track just with a couple of numbers and figures and things like that so if you can bear with me, I'd appreciate that. Okay, so I want you to imagine, you know how it feels when the venue is packed and there's a power outage and you may begin to feel anxious, overwhelmed, heart beating faster, breathing beginning to change. Can you recognize that stress response? I'm sure many of you can. That, it that happens, is, happens all too often. <laughs> that is a stress response. And uh, we've got to learn what to do when that happens and how to manage it. And actually, there was a good example just earlier where Jason explained what he did today with his breathing. And I'll talk to you more about that. It is important, though. Sorry, this uh, slides are not very. I can. So one of the things that I've learned about stress, one of the really important things I've learned is the story we tell ourselves about it is really powerful. 
So yes, there's stress and yes, there are some strategies that we can use, dietary strategies and breathing and things like that can be really helpful for stress. But I think the other thing that is really important is understanding how much what you believe about stress and what you say to yourself about stress, how much of an effect that has, because it actually has a really, really huge effect. So what we know is that there was actually a study done in the US they tracked 30,000 adults over eight years. And they started by asking people how much stress they had experienced in the last year. They also asked them, do you believe that the stress is harmful to your health? And what they did is they followed their death records to see what happened to those people down the track. What they found is actually really interesting what they found is the people who actually believed, sorry, I'm not very good with keeping up the slides, but it's not working very well, my slide thing. It's kind of slow. Let me take over. Yeah. You just do your thing and I'll Yeah, if you take slides. over the slides because they're just not, uh, yeah. they're not keeping up with me. So maybe if you play with them, you kind of know where we're at. It might, otherwise I'm just going to get too distracted trying to figure out because it's not working. That's good. That's better. So anyway, I'll just confirm in this study. So what they did is they asked the people how, how much stress they'd had in the last year and how much whether they thought that stress was affecting their health. And the interesting thing was that they found that people who had higher stress in the last 12 months actually did have a 43% increased risk in dying, which is huge, right? But what they found is that was actually only for the people who believed that the stress was bad for them. So the people who were most likely to die were the people who had a lot of stress and thought the stress was bad for them. The people who were least likely to die were the people who didn't view stress as harmful. They'd have, they had high stress, but they didn't think it was going to be harmful for their health. They even did better than the people in the study who said they hadn't had much stress in the last 12 months. So it wasn't not having much stress that saved people. It was having stress, but knowing that they would be okay and believing that stress wasn't harmful to their health. So that is huge. What they found is that that particular year um, or over that particular time, they found 182,000 Americans died prematurely, not from stress, but from the belief that stress is bad for you. And um, a couple of slides back, there was actually a, a little sample of a stress, physical symptoms that you can get from stress, because we do know that it is there, the effects of stress on the body. I couldn't quite get it to work before. This does tell you all of the different things that you can get, all of the problems we know that, you know, it can affect your heart health and it can affect your hormones and, it, you know, your muscles get tight and it can reduce your immune system. It can do all of these things. The interesting thing, though, is I spent years teaching people all of this stuff, but then I realized that, yes, it can do all those things. And yes, it's really important to learn strategies around that. But the power of what you believe is more powerful than anything. So honestly, just believing that, yes, I've got lots of stress right now, but I will be okay. That actually is the most important, you know, I've started to talk to eat this and do this and do that. But honestly, I now believe that just believing that you'll be okay makes a really, really big difference. So honestly, it's, it was a really big study and it was quite uh, shocking to find out. You would have thought that the people with the least amount of stress would have been the people who were least likely to die, but it was the people with the, a lot of stress, but they believed that they would be fine. So what you believe is true, uh, as I think Henry Ford is the one that said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, can't you're right. Yes. It's the same thing, isn't it? Yes. It's <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm I'm a big big believer in that, and you know, I've also there's another a beautiful Buddhist. I'll put the camera on a beautiful Buddhist expression that I use a lot, which is you know when life shoots an arrow into you, don't shoot another arrow into yourself, you know. So does don't exacerbate that that issue and worry and you know and, and can further impact it. Yes, yeah, and you do hear it if you listen to either the way you're talking to yourself, the way you talk to others, or if you just listen to the way other people talk. You can almost tell how well people are going to go by by how much they, oh my God, it's the end of the world. You know, the language we use is really powerful. So when we say this is really stressful, oh, it's going to make me sick and oh, I'm going to end up in hospital, you know, and people often use that 
when they're dealing with sick people as well, they say, oh, I'm going to end up in here next. You know, I hear that all of the time and I totally get it uh, after my experience last year. But just don't say that. You just say, no, I will be fine. I will be fine. This is really stressful. However, I will be fine. And I want to define a couple of things. Um, so I'm going to first talk to you about the states of the nervous system. So there's a few different states that your nervous system can be in. And so you might have heard of some of them. So some of some of you might have heard of fight or flight. Uh, that's a stress response. And that's what I was talking about earlier when I was saying you get the blackout and there's breathing in the heart's starts going that sort of thing so fight or flight is the stress response and when we're in fight or flight what happens is the blood flow goes to your heart and it goes to your arms and your legs and to your eyes it's so that you can see so that you're you can run because fight or flight literally was if you've got a bear chasing after you, <laughs> you need to be able to do something about that, right? So it was literally made so that you can either fight the bear or run from the bear. So it's really important that we get all the nutrients so that you, know, you can be strong. I think you've probably all heard stories of the mother who's lifted a car off the baby or something, you know, literally you get this power because it's like you suddenly kind of go into fight or flight. The problem is when you're in fight or flight, no circulation goes to your digestive system or to your reproductive system, uh, which I think is one of the reasons why we have so many reproductive health issues and so many uh, digestive issues. Because if we spend a lot of time in the stress response, we're not actually able to make di you know, digestive enzymes and we're not able to make hormones correctly and all things we need for those things to work. And essentially it's your body sort of just saying, because your body believes you. So if you respond to the deadline or the difficult customer or whatever it is, if you respond to that, like it's a really big deal, your body literally does think it's a bear. And so if your body's got to decide between, you know, are you going to digest lunch or are you going to avoid becoming lunch? your body is going to avoid you becoming lunch. And so all the, all the circulation goes away from the digestive system so that you can get away from the bear. And so it's important to understand this because when you understand that that's what your body thinks, then you can start to actually change things because we have to make sure that our body knows that there's no bear, even, even a deadline, even a blackout, even a difficult customer is, doesn't mean you're about to immediately die. <laughs> But our body actually thinks that that's what's happening. And it's really important that we understand that our body believes that. And we need to let our body know that it's not the case. Because the problem is for many of us, we actually stay in this fight or flight a large percentage of the time. I would argue that some people are in it all of the time. Because we've got these lives now where everything is on and we've got, you know, <laughs> once upon a time, I was showing my age but you know once upon a time I would finish work and go and get on the train and go home and I had no phone and there was no internet and they couldn't email me at home and if there was a problem at 10 o'clock at night there's not much I could do about it unless I physically go back there uh, and I worked in an office so it wasn't a situation where I'd have to physically go back there but so when you did finish you finished but now we do have this kind of on life where everything's coming at us from every different direction and I would argue that a lot of us in this, we have this busy, 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 busy. So many of us, most of us are living this busy, busy life. So even just if you're not feeling so stressed or if you're not feeling, because sometimes people associate with stress with freaking out or, you know, obvious stress, but sometimes it's actually just the busyness of being on and then the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So just that itself becomes a fight or flight because again because our body is the same as our ancestors and if you think back to our ancestors you're living back in in the village somewhere you know eventually what would happen is the sun will go down and you know you'd light the fire or you'd have candles or whatever you'd have but you wouldn't have devices in your face until one in the morning you know you, you just didn't have that unnatural light and all of those things kind of um stimulating your system all of the time you kind of just had the day ended and things calmed down and things slowed down and you know so our lives are so different now but our bodies are not different our bodies exactly the same but it's actually dealing with a whole new uh, surroundings a whole new environment and that's one of the reasons we're having issues as well is that so many health issues is that we just haven't quite adapted well as well to our environment and that's why so many of us is overwhelmed all the time and feeling stressed 
because we're not using the strategies that we need to use to help us uh, stay well and manage our stress. So fight or flight, I would argue that a lot of us are there a lot of the time and that's what I was, you know, that stress response, that's what fight or flight is. Rest and digest is where you should be most of the time. So rest and digest is kind of what it sounds like is, you know, when you're sleeping and when you're digesting your food. And so when you're in rest and digest, you can actually make digestive enzymes and break your food down rather than it sitting there and just never going anywhere because you weren't able to make any enzymes because you're eating in the car on the way somewhere. Uh, so rest and digest is actually when your body can replenish and repair and do all the things it needs to do. And we should really be there most of the time because, um, you know, we're not being chased by a bear. Excuse me, I'm just having some water. You're not being chased by a bear, therefore you don't have to respond as if you're being chased by a bear. So um, I've got some strategies that I will go through with you to, to teach you how to put yourself into rest and digest and how to stay there. There's another state that people might not have heard of as much. It's called tend and befriend. And tend and befriend historically is something that women were really good at. I'm not trying to be sexist or anything. It's just the way it was. And it's one because of just how we're wired. But also, if you, again, if you think about it in terms of our ancestors, if we had something, if, if the, you know, if the bear did come into the village or maybe the other people, the other tribe attacked or something like that, the women actually had to look after the elderly, look after the children, maybe look after their small animals, whatever they had to do, but they, they couldn't necessarily fight or fly. I'm not saying that they never did any of that. Of course, there was all sorts of different things that happened in those times. However, their job largely was to just look after the people who needed looking after. So they, rather than do that fight or flight, they had to go and attend and befriend. And women have also just learned over time that that, you know, women are just much better at kind of talking to a friend about a problem. So we'll, we'll go up and we'll tell our girlfriends about, oh, geez, this thing happened and I'm feeling like this and, uh, and we'll kind of talk about things. So we're just more wired to do that. And, um, and men are learning that now that we don't have bears attacking the village and <laughs> those sorts of things going on, but men are wired differently and it's, and it's different. It's, it is a different skill for them. Um, attend and befriend also is very much associated with the hormone oxytocin and oxytocin is a hormone that's very much associated with uh, birth and breastfeeding, which is also why women are much more familiar with that hormone. Um, but, um, but I will talk about attend and befriend or talk about that, that hormone a little bit in a little while, but um, but yeah, tendon befriend is just the other the other sort of place that you can be in where you're using different strategies because um because you yeah they're the strategies you need to use at the time. So anyway, uh, so next slide, please. So I just want to talk about the different kinds of stress. So we've got physical stress and we've got emotional stress. So with physical stress, a low nutrient diet alone can cause physical stress if you don't have the nutrients you need to make things in your body then your body will be stressed and we we sometimes forget that our body is made of billions of cells and those cells break down and we have to make new ones and they break down and we had to make new ones and if you don't have the ingredients that you need to make healthy cells then your body can't function well and it doesn't function well. And if you're eating either not enough nutrients and or poor quality foods, the processed foods and drinks, same difference really, because if you're eating processed stuff, your poor body and your poor liver is dealing with all the stress of dealing with the processed stuff. And if you're eating processed stuff, you're not likely to be eating a high nutrient diet. So you're going to be lower nutrients and you're going to be, your poor liver is going to be trying to deal with the stress of dealing with the processed foods or too much alcohol or whatever it is. Uh, so <laughs> someone's someone in there just saying it looks like a, their daily routine. Yeah, exactly. A lot of us I, can relate to this. <laughs> that was that was me guilty as charged. I, I wouldn't mind just pausing for a second. You know, we we got a few people on the line here. Um, I just want to see from you guys what what, what hits home. Can you relate? <laughs> Alex is laughing. Can you relate to this? I mean, hospitality notorious for poor, you know, regularity of, of meals. Um, obviously, you know, the glopin, the, uh, you know, infamous glopin where you close and then open again and your body is not getting to sleep. Um, and then just grabbing anything, a Macca's run on the way home. So I, I just, I just like to sort of see how this has landed and see, see if you're there right now, or maybe if you've 
taken steps to get out of there. I mean, for example, I'm on the light and easy right now, quite healthy, quite portioned, and it's just fixing one part of it. Um, but yeah, just anyone, anyone else got anything to add on that? Or they just here for the expert? No, you're just listening. Just listening. Well, feel free to, uh, sleep is a big one, I think, says Alex. Yeah. Uh, I, I totally agree. Um, guys, feel free. This is interactive. Um, so feel free, you know, to chime up, drop on the something on the chat box, what have you, because, you know, Fiona's here for you. So uh, she's setting the scene right now. She's going to get us some strategies. So, yeah, feel free to sort of uh, just hit her up. All right, I'll shut up. <laughs> Uh, you're absolutely right about sleep too. Sleep is actually the foundation for all good health. And I actually see sometimes with clients who'd be talking to me about, oh, I'm getting up at 4 a.m. so I can go to the gym. And, and I said, well, what time did you go to bed? And they're saying, oh, I'm going to bed at midnight or, or 11. And as much as I advocate for the gym, it's not more important than sleep. You need to get sleep. That is absolute foundation of all of this. There was actually a sleep study done. It was it's one individual. They did this, uh, this experiment on this one person and he was young and he was healthy. He was in his 20s. He was a uni student and he was a sportsman. I think he was doing martial arts and maybe football or some other sport. And they what they did is they deprived him of sleep. They didn't change anything else. They just deprived his sleep. And they actually had to stop the experiment early because I think within a week he'd started to become uh, pre-diabetes within that week. It's pre-diabetic, you know, um, and that was just lack of sleep. And we know that lack of sleep can actually lead to just on its own without anything else that can lead to diabetes. But then you add to it, if you do have a lack of sleep, you are also more likely to grab for the sugar and the caffeine and those things because you're tired and so you just want to pep yourself up and you know get through the day and then you are also more likely to once you're on that track then then you'll be going the the junk food and and whatever else you sort of go for um throughout the day and so we we do tend to when we're not sleeping well start to make poor choices for ourselves so um so it is important to understand that the um yeah sleep is really important so you're absolutely right for all of those things uh and too much exercise or not enough exercise they're both that sort of physical stress so then we go into emotional stress and emotional stress you know would be things like like feeling disconnected actually is a huge one so many of us don't feel connected especially the last couple of years with all that's gone on in the world a lot of us are feeling quite disconnected uh, but it could be grief it could be feeling overwhelmed it could be fa failure guilt rejection all sorts of things so we have physical and we have emotional stress and and they both will affect us um, so I want to just talk a little bit about food and mood because what can we do well we can eat well so you know food is a whole topic on its own and I could do a three-hour seminar on this so let's just keep it sort of short and sweet but my number one rule for for food is you have to have protein with every meal now I personally prefer animal protein so whether it's kind of meat or fish or chicken or eggs or that kind of thing if you prefer vegetarian proteins go for your life do what's right for you but essentially protein is what all of our neurotransmitters in our brain are made from so things like serotonin dopamine melatonin all of those things that help you feel balanced help you sleep uh, give you a, a relaxed and comfortable happy mood all of that uh, are is made from protein. So if you're not eating protein, then you're not going to be able to make those neurotransmitters as well. And not only that, but pretty much your whole body is made from protein. So your muscles, your skin, your bones, all of it. So protein is vitally important. Protein also keeps you keeps your blood sugar levels quite regulated, quite smooth over time. So what happens is your blood sugar levels will stay really stable and you won't get too hungry to your next meal. Um, whereas when you're not eating protein, we tend to eat more carb than protein. So we eat sort of more of the pasta or the rice or the, the bread, all those kinds of things, What ha or cereal. What happens is our blood sugar goes up and then it drops suddenly. Uh, and so we get that, often get that sort of hangry thing. I don't know if anyone here can relate to the hangry but hungry and angry, right? And that's because our blood sugar levels have dropped. And that can happen because you just haven't eaten in a really long time, of course. But 
it often happens because when we did eat, we didn't have any protein in that meal. And the protein is what keeps that blood sugar levels really stable to your next meal and stops you from having that sudden drop unless you leave it five or six or seven hours, then you're going to get a drop, right? But having protein in the meal is really important and good fats as well. Now, often if you've got the protein there already, there'll be good fats in there because there'll be fats in things like fish or meat, or there'll be fats in things like eggs or nuts and seeds. Um, or otherwise it would be things like, you know, your beautiful cold pressed extra virgin olive oil or, you know, those kinds of avocado, right? So fats and oils also help you keep nice and balanced to your next meal. And fats are also what a lot large part of your body is made from. So a large part of your body is made from fat and a large part of your body is made from protein. And that's why there are such things as essential amino acids, which are protein and essential fatty acids, which are types of fats. They are essential because you don't make them at all or you don't make enough for survival. So they are essential to consume. So you're mostly made from fat and protein. So they're the most important things to have in your meal. And then with the with the carbohydrate, the most important thing is to just get a colorful range of mostly vegetables, a little bit of fruit, and yeah, a little bit of rice and stuff here, although that's fine. It depends on the individual as to how much of that they should have. But essentially protein with every meal, good fats, and a colorful range of vegetables is the best way to go. And um, keeping sugar to a minimum. I don't know if anyone saw that sugar film, but it's really worth watching. And in that film, he was eating what was the average Australian diet at the time as far as how much sugar, and it was equivalent of 40 teaspoons of sugar per day. And within 17 days, he started to develop fatty liver and he was getting pre-diabetic. And he wasn't having it in ice cream and soft drink. He was actually having it in it was low-fat yogurt and uh, and sauces and cereals and all of the so-called health foods. So my other rule in regards to food is if your great-grandmother didn't recognize it as food, it's probably not food. So try and eat just real food. It's actually just vegetables and protein and nuts and seeds and eggs and things you can recognize as food. If you turn around the packet and you look at the packet and you, you need a biochemistry degree to understand what's in there, that's not food. Stay away from that. And, um, and on that note, it is important to stay away from largely as much as you can from the cheap seed and vegetable oils. So essentially when you go into a supermarket and you buy oils, you buy, like I said, the, the extra virgin olive oil, the, the good quality oils are more expensive they come in glass usually, and they come in a dark bottle. So if they're cheap in a clear plastic bottle, um, then they're the ones that are really bad for you. They actually damage the cells in your body and cause things like insulin resistance and loads of health problems. So stick with the good quality oils, good quality foods, things that your great grandmother would have recognized as food. And if you don't, if you need biochemistry degree, it's not food. If you're eating that range of colorful vegetables and things too, that will feed your microbiome and your microbiomes, are, you know, all the gut bacteria and bugs and things, they're a really important part of your immune system and of your health. And actually, if your microbiome is out of whack, that can actually cause on its own, that can cause anxiety and depression. So I've seen it in clients where they've just got a certain um, they've got an abundance of a kind of bacteria that's not good for them and don't have enough of the good kind of bacteria. And it really can and does affect your mental health. So having a healthy microbiome is important. So any questions about the food stuff before I move on? Yeah, I think um, I really understand. Well, I'll just put the video on. I really understand why you, you're you talking about food because it's something that we kind of know. We see all the, the pyramids and the charts and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but we often don't, uh, I'll just flick the side off, uh, we often don't really um, necessarily discipline ourselves to make sure that that mix is there. Um, <clears throat> what would be, you know, your top, say, three tips, just if you, you know, you're busy, you're running around, you're stressed, you know, and, and obviously there's other techniques you're going to talk about, uh, just in terms of if you are snacking something nice and easy and healthy, you know, <clears throat> where you are going out to a fast food restaurant or, you know, a quick food restaurant, is it Subway? And like, you know, what, what would be the, you know, your recommendations for just trying to mm. regulate that in a busy lifestyle? Yeah. Well, for me, it's wherever you can get protein. So if I was getting a takeaway, I'd probably go to a chicken place okay. <laughs> or, I, or I would go to a, a, for me, I can't eat gluten. That's just me personally, but so I'd go to a burger joint and just get the 
not get the patty, <laughs> get the burger without the bun or something. You can have the bun if you like. But essentially, I'm just looking for protein. So if it's a snack, it might be nuts and seeds or it might be full fat yogurt. Um, but I'm always looking for where's the protein. It might be a piece of cheese. Uh, so, or miso soup is also a great protein or a bone broth. You can drink a bone broth. Dick. They can just get both of those in a powdered form. And that's a really good protein drink that you can have, um, or a protein bar or something like that. If you like, just make sure if you get a protein bar, it's not full of sugar. Some of them are loads of sugar. Uh, and to give it, get a bit of an idea of that, uh, four grams of sugar is a tip at a teaspoon of sugar. So if it says it's got 20 grams of sugar in there, that's five teaspoons of sugar. And that's an awful lot in one bar. You don't want more than one or two teaspoons of sugar in something, not five. What would you say then about soft drinks? Uh, you know, we often just see a post-mix guns there at the ready. We have a quick Coke kind of again, fuels us up a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you, would, you know, I've, I've gone to the Pepsi Max more recently, but then even then I've heard stories yeah, Pepsi Max is double the uh, double the caffeine, so I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, that can be really cause major major issues. Uh, my brother, at the age of thirty three, had a cardiac arrest. He literally dropped dead and had to be revived. And he is a healthy police officer. He was actually running after a perpetrator at the time, and he was gym all the time and no heart disease. And that was because he was caning all these caffeine drinks and all of these uh, energy drinks. So I would stay well away from double double caffeine anything. <laughs> um, and I don't think look, lots of studies have come out recently about artificial sweetness. So the whole kind of diet zero whatever. I actually think with things like soft drinks and and you know whether it's whether it's sugar or whether it's diet or whatever. I don't think there really is a healthy way to have soft drink. I think you just back off and either don't have it at all or just keep it to a minimal. Mm. Um, but certainly don't go the double caffeine varieties. I don't think having you know zero or or lower the called um, sugar free or whatever it's called diet. I don't think that's any healthier than having the sugar to to tell you the truth. Uh, but um, I think just there's I don't think there's just there's no such thing as a free lunch they're all junk food really and they're all they they those kind of drinks they suck nutrients out of your body too they they actually do they're quite there's foods that give you nutrients and there's foods that actually take them from you and things like soft drinks take them from you so i actually alex, alex has just commented too saying gotta to say diabetes isn't fun i actually forgot mate um it, yeah so you deal with that which yeah, that's a whole yeah. lifestyle change. So in that case, obviously the zeros and the diets actually work better, but what works even better is not having them at all. Mm. So essentially water is what I drink. Or if I really want something kind of a bit different, I'll have something like a kombucha. I really like it. Not everyone does. Um, or if you do want to have like a little bit of a soft drink sort of thing, have something like a, a mineral water and just maybe put a little bit of a flavor in it, but not a lot. So there's not much sugar in that and you just get that little bit of flavor and it feels a bit like a soft drink, but it's not quite as full on as a something with 13 teaspoons of sugar in it, you know, <laughs> does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Think yeah, that's, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I just like to say there's a perfect answer with soft drink, but it's not really, it's uh, junk food is junk food and you just have to treat it that way and know that it's not the greatest. So at the beginning, we were talking about that stress response, you know, that blackout and that sort of your heart starts going and all of that sort of thing. Uh, and what's really important to understand is with the stress response, uh, you can harness the power of it if you understand it. So first of all, I already told you before what was happening, you know, your heart's beating faster because it's, you know, your blood flow is going to your arms and legs and to your eyes and, you know, you have to do your heart because um, you're in this stress response. So that's what's going on. But what happens is a lot of us, especially people who suffer from, from anxiety, we actually perceive it as a negative thing. And with, oh no, you know, we, we start going into that like negative mind frame of what's happening. And, and the truth is that it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's your body actually preparing to help you through a challenge. And so there's a couple of things around it. Firstly, if it's an inappropriate stress response, like me, when I see a cockroach, then it's about me just saying, hey, Fiona, you don't need to go into the stress response. You can stay in rest and digest. You're safe. You're well. You're fine. So sometimes if it's kind of a non-event thing and it's kind of you going into a stress response for no reason, it is about kind of explaining to yourself that you're fine. You don't you know, need to worry about that. But in the cases where maybe it's, you know, it might be if you're doing a presentation for work or if you're going for a job interview, you're doing an exam or doing something that's sort of stressful for you. It actually is, you know, it can be a good thing. It's actually there for a reason. And what it does is that it can actually help with your performance. 
And again, we were talking about narrative, like the way you talk or think about it. What they found is uh, this was another study. So in this study, what they did is they they taught people to reframe their stress response before they put them through something stressful. I think it was exams. I think that they put them through. Uh, that was at university somewhere. And so they told them that that pounding heart is preparing your body for action. You're breathing faster so you can get more oxygen to your brain. And ultimately, they were told that the stress response was helpful uh, for their performance. And what happened is the people who actually reframed the stress response found that they felt less stressed, less anxious, and more confident. So it changed their performance because they felt really relaxed about it. Oh, okay, this is my body helping me. Cool. As opposed to, oh, my God, I'm having a stress response. So even just knowing physically what a stress response is and knowing that it can benefit you is really really helpful can, can i just chuck a quick one in there sure. i got to uh, meet shelly taylor smith you know one of the legends of uh, marathon swimming uh, at a conference once and she told a story about the thing she hated the most about those long distance swims was the jellyfish right and that they would she'd be swimming through them all and they'd be stinging you as you're she's swimming and it would broke up her rhythm it, it freaked her out and you know she just said i just can't get over this thing and then she went to a, like a mindset coach <clears throat> and talk about reframing. Uh, he said to her, um, look, don't imagine that you know, they're there to harm you. They're actually kissing you and cheering you on. And uh, it was a complete reversal of her thinking of the situation. And she went on to uh, win, you know, and, and she's, I think, the fastest, you know, marathon swimmer in many men's events um, because she overcome this, this fear, which was a stress response to the, to the environment she was in. Mm. I just found that fat, it just reminded me of that when, you, when you're talking about that. Yes. So the cockroach is here to kiss me. <laughs> <laughs> see, see if I can get that one happening. I don't know. <laughs> but you're absolutely right, though. It's, it's what you tell yourself. And that's what the power of that is. And the interesting thing, too, in regards to this particular study is it wasn't just emotionally that they felt better. What they found too is that because so when we have a stress response, what can happen is you can have the, you know, your blood vessels can constrict. And that's where the whole cardiovascular heart attack, those kinds of things come in as being a risk. Because if you're if you're regularly constricting those blood vessels, there's going to be problems there, right? So what they found though in this study is the the participants who actually were just told to reframe the stress, they didn't, they didn't constrict, they didn't constrict their blood vessels. So they didn't have the physiological response of the stress, which was the constricted blood vessels. So again, that belief that they had, it changed physically, like emotionally how they responded to it, but physically how they responded to it as well. And imagine how powerful that is. Like, really, that's the difference between dying young from a heart attack or not, because you're either regularly constricting the blood vessels. And, you know, uh, we were talking about this hormone before, but the hormone that does that is oxytocin. So that tendon befriend hormone is actually heart protective. It's cardio protective. It actually helps your heart uh, recover from a stress response and it helps you stay well throughout a stress response. So I think that is actually the physical uh, thing that's happening when, when, you are, uh, when you are reframing this for yourself. The physical thing that's happening is oxytocin is kicking in. And there's a few ways to sort of get oxytocin to kick in. So it's actually the cuddle hormone. So cuddles are great, but of course, with consenting, <laughs> consenting adults or, or, you know, with your children or whatever's appropriate, but you know what I'm saying. But cuddling actually is really uh, useful for that. But also look, and, and it's one of the reasons why it's look just that whole connection thing I was talking about right at the beginning, feeling connected. When we have connection with family and friends and other people and um, and touch is really important, all different kinds of touch, but just like, hey, mate, how are you going? Someone touch your arm, whatever. All of those things are really good for oxytocin. But also um, the other thing that's really helpful for it is actually doing acts of kindness or doing something for someone else. What we know is if you do something kind for someone else, if you're caring for someone else, that actually you will also be producing oxytocin. And that was actually another study. And this other study, what they said is they said caring creates resilience. And what they found is, again, this time it was, again, it was in the US and it was a thousand adults in this study. 
and they asked the people um, about how much stress they'd had and how much time they'd spent helping out friends or neighbours in their community or all their community. And again, they used the public records. And what they found is that people having financial difficulties or stress, they had an increased risk of dying by 30%. But it wasn't true for everyone. People who spent time caring for others showed absolutely no increased risk of dying. Um, they had a zero risk of dying compared, you know, um, compared to the people who were stressed and, um, and weren't doing the acts of kindness and weren't caring about others. So essentially, they said that caring created resilience. And, um, and so that's, again, really powerful. That, so that's a way to hack that sort of oxytocin. So if you are feeling lonely and disconnected and maybe you live on your own, maybe you don't get that sort of you know, hugs with your children or whatever it is, um, go and help someone, go and visit people in a hospital, go and help at a dog shelter, whatever it is, but just do something kind for someone else. And that can create that resilience for you and then you're producing the oxytocin um, by doing that. So I just think that's really powerful so much in this there's a practical things like sleep and the way you eat and you know and of course moving your body all of those things but so much of this is what you tell yourself about stress and whether or not you know how to hack these uh these hormones and so yeah basically caring creates resilience uh and i would just say my only caveat to that would be just be aware those if you're one of those people who cares for everybody and never for yourself that's not helpful. <laughs> I know a few people like that. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes, oh, then that's probably be one of the reasons they can survive as long as they do, because I suppose they have all that oxytocin, but I still think it is important to care for ourselves as well. But that sort of caring for others can be really, really helpful too. So now I think it's time for just review a couple of strategies that you can use that can make all the difference for you. And one of those is the one that Jason was talking about before is, is the breathing technique. So the breathing technique that I explained to him was if you breathe in for four seconds and then out for seven seconds, you do that for one minute. So at six breaths. So if six times you sort of breathe in for four, out for seven, Essentially, the idea is you're just having a longer out breath. If you do that for one minute, which is six breaths, it actually takes your body from fight or flight and puts it back into rest and digest. And rest and digest is where you want to be most of the time. So it's one thing I encourage my clients to do before meals always, because my clients are always coming to me with digestive issues. So I want to make sure that they're absorbing their nutrients and that they're not kind of having all those digestive symptoms. So before a meal is a good idea because you really need to be in that uh, rest and digest. And if you learn to do it before a meal, it will just get you in the habit of doing it fairly regularly. Um, but the other time you can do it, of course, is... Uh, <laughs> when all of your equipment breaks down and nothing's working and you're about to do a presentation <laughs> and you feel you're starting to sweat and feel that there's a certain amount of out. discipline involved in that isn't there like a you know you your natural inclination when you're that stressed out is to run faster and just try to you know almost just you know jump across the hot coals but to actually well i've heard the expression slow down and go faster right so to actually stop or slow down and, and discipline yourself. I love that breathing technique, by the way, you know, four in, seven out, one minute, really mm -hmm. easy to remember. But to have that discipline to do that in those really stressful times, I think you get back control of your state as much as you do affect your hormones. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I think that's very powerful. Yes. And, and that's why I recommend if you attach it to things like meals, like if you get in the habit of doing it before meals, you'll be doing it two or three times a day, right? And that already gets you in the habit of doing it. But my, uh, what I always recommend to my clients is learn these strategies and learn things that help you with your stress when you're not so stressed so that they come more naturally to you when you are. So if you've already learned that, you know, like protein makes me feel really grounded. If I'm getting off in the sky and off, if I kind of take off and she's not landing, where is she? The best thing you can do is give me protein, right? So, you know, if, if, if I learn to do those things and if I just learn as a routine that they're the things that I do and if, if I start feeling really stressed, uh, you know, what do I need to do? Do I need to drink water? Do I need to move my body? Do I need to shake it off? Uh, you know, what do I need to breathe? What do I need to do? If I, if I practice those all of the time, 
they become something that's easier for me to find when I need it. Because you're not going to learn a great new way of responding to stress when you're in the middle of something really stressful or when you're having a panic attack. So if you start learning these strategies just in a daily basis, just practicing different things, they can, it's, it's building new neural pathways. We have these neural pathways in our brain and we develop them. And, you know, an example of that is a baby, you know, when a baby's born, they can't walk, but over time they do the, you know, they do the bum shuffle and they do the crawling and they do all the different things to the point where they, they can walk and they're building neural pathways to do that. And we can do the same thing. So we might have a really good neural pathway to freaking out. That might be our natural bang, freak out. That might be something we've gotten really good at. So we actually have to build neural pathways to being calm. And the way we do that is by doing it a thousand times until, you know, fall over a thousand times. And then eventually you can do it like a baby learning to walk. So uh, building your neural pathways is really important. And so just practicing these things as an everyday thing, yeah, it becomes something that you have that's, that's uh, available to you. So, you know, the summary really is be aware of your narrative. Uh, know that you can hack your stress hormones. And so you can really use that oxytocin, that kind of tender befriend hormone, uh, whether it's kindness to others or whether it's appropriate touching or whatever that looks like. But certainly you can harness those hormones. Uh, your narrative is really powerful. If you tell yourself the stress is killing me, you are right. But if you tell yourself you'll be okay, you'll be right about that too. And just remember to breathe, you know, sometimes I've just got to, you know, and then sometimes when you're really overwhelmed and there's lots going on in your life, maybe all the other things are just not practical. Maybe you can't do any of those things at that moment, but you can breathe, you, know, you can do that. So just do that. So instead of just do what you can do as well, rather than going, oh, I can't do all of that. It's all too hard. Can I go, well, what, what can I do? I'll do that. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a summary of those strategies. Isn't it? It's so simple, but you know, we kind of take it for granted. Like, you know, you, the eating rights not on here, but we know that, right? Mm. Um, being aware of your narrative is interesting because you have to sort of reshape your common beliefs that hey, it's so tough, it's so hard, I'm so stressed, and you got to repro. It's like NLP, isn't it? Reprogramming that thought to, no, I'm going to be okay. I've been through this before. You know, I've, I've been another expression I've heard is God never gives you anything that you can't handle, right? Yeah. You know, so just sort of talking yourself down. The, 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 I think we're pretty good in our business of high-fiving each other and, you know, giving someone a hug when they needs one, mm -hmm. but certainly being able to have that opportunity around your, you know, outside of work as well with your loved one or your children and all the rest. Uh, and then that, yeah, you know, I'm a fan of that breathing technique. That's, uh, that's great. Simple stuff, but really, you know, are we doing it? <laughs> you know, maybe, yeah. You know, how do you recommend we, we actually start implementing this? Like I read the book Atomic Habits over the, the little break I had, and it was just talked about starting small, you know, not over, not trying to do everything. Well, I got to eat right. I got to exercise. I got to mm. think differently. I, you know, it's a lot. So yeah. where would you start? Like so to, starting small is right. And look, breathing, start with that. Cause you can do that. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to go shopping. <laughs> you just, so you can literally just start with that and get, a, get in the habit of breathing before meals and, and or just reminding yourself to breathe any time that you start feeling overwhelmed or you start sort of feeling that stress response happening. So you can start there and then you can kind of look at those different ideas and think, well, okay, what else is practical for me? And whatever feels practical and doable for you, just start with that. And I think it is like, to me, it's, it's just like little habits, little habits, little habits. So if you practice a breathing for a, a few weeks or a month or so, it'll just become something you do. And then you might say, okay, now I'm going to make sure that I'm having protein. Okay, let's look at that. What does that look like? And you start sort of bringing protein into your diet and you do that for a month or so until it sort of just becomes normal. So I think, yeah, it's small and steady. Uh, I think we, we can sort of what happens is if we try and just go all in, we just overwhelm ourselves and then we end up just throwing the whole lot away. Whereas you can kind of just say, look, what's practical for me right now? That's what I'll do now. And then just put the other things on the list for next month, I'll start doing that. The month after I'll start doing that. Something like that. Just make it simple. That's, uh, that's awesome. Um, am I on mute? No, I'm not. Um, cool. And uh, I'm just going to put the link to that um, Atomic Habits. Uh, actually, no, that went to you, Fiona. Let me put it to everyone. Um, whether it's audio book or whether it's, um, you know, whether it's you read it like me, if you got to, you know, it took me, took me about four or five days to read it. And I wrote a whole note and rearranged my morning habit 
to just do things around. It's really interesting psychology behind it. <clears throat> For the stuff you're talking about, I think it helps to have a bit of a structure strategy to sort of implement them into your life. Um, cool. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that's the end of the slide deck, but we're almost out of time. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, what will you do? All right. So this is a question for the, you know, the few that are on the call or anyone who's watching um, on Facebook Live. You know, what, what will you do? What's your commitment? Um, what's one thing you can take as a result of spending an hour with Fiona, kind of opening your mind to these things? Um, is, there, is there one little idea? And, you know, you're allowed to say breathe. Um, but just yeah, type something in the in the chat box and and let us know um, because it's just good for good for Fiona to get some feedback as well. Um, whether it's a bit more protein, a bit better sleep, you know, start small. Um, I'll be interested to hear. More focus on food, Brad says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And he's a chef. <laughs> I thought you did focus on food <laughs> for <laughs> but, everybody but, else. <laughs> but the right food. Um, so uh, so look, that's that's a good one. Yeah, his own food. Yeah, good. <laughs> Um, and uh, Alex, what about you, mate? Got um, got something in mind that's percolating right now? Uh, I knew stress was a hunger suppressant, but wasn't wasn't where it inhibited digestive enzymes. I thought that was a yeah. I thought that was a very salient point, uh, Fiona. About I I've had digestive issues over the years, and I know it's been stress related because I went to the doctors and did all this and. And then eventually I learned how to do some breathing techniques. Funny enough, mm -hmm. way back when, forgot them and then re rediscovered them now. But mm -hmm. yeah, to, the fact that it actually doesn't allow you to process your food. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, you know, that's, that's more people should know that. Yeah. Yeah. And for some of us, uh, stress isn't an appetite suppressant. For some of us, it makes us eat. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm mm -hmm. saying it for a friend. <laughs> yeah. and, Chefs, apparently Brad says chefs are never hungry until the end of service. Yeah, because you're just too busy looking after everyone else, <laughs> aren't you? Um, well, I want to. I, I really want to thank you, Fiona. Um, I, I love. If there's any questions here, please come off mute now because you, this is your chance. You got a couple of minutes before the call finishes uh, to maybe hit Fiona up. Um, but yeah, you know, thank you so much for agreeing to do this and and sharing your your insights. You know, some of that we we think we know. But I do like the fact that you entered, you talked about those studies that actually proved that this isn't just someone's advice. Mm. This is actually science. Yes, yes, exactly. And then also just so everyone knows that you can go to my website, which is informedhealth.com.au, and you can actually book a 20-minute strategy session with me or Rebecca, my colleague, uh, just to find out if we can help you and what's what's the best way to move forward if you, if you need help with us. Oh, otherwise, you can just go to my website and just check out lots of blogs and I do lots of radio and stuff like that. So you'll just find lots of interesting info if you want that. Awesome. Oh, well, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you so much uh, for those that did turn up, you know, Fiona, we've we spoken about our business. It's so much good stuff going on for the people that are full timers. You know, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of hours for the people that are working part time, they're often studying as well. Um, and, you know, balancing bills and life. Um, so just refreshing to get some, some grounding information, make us think a bit more about what to do for ourselves, mm. you know, versus giving everything away to others as we do most day, you know, most every other day. And there's also always something you can do. Even if it's just one thing, there's just always this one thing you can do. So it's just understanding to start small. Start small. Well, thank you so much. Start small, eat good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, food for thought. I like that. Good comment from Brad to close it out. The, did I just mention that? He's the uh, winner of the best Metropolitan Hotel of the year of the universe. Uh, <laughs> blessed to have you here, my friend. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to see you a bit later, actually, because I'll be in there. Uh, thanks, everyone who tuned in online and for all those who do tune out of curiosity you know, on Facebook Live after this finishes. Thanks again, Fiona. So, so lovely to meet you and, and do this with you. Thank you. Bye for now. Thanks, guys. Bye.